All right, friends, I'm so excited for who you get to meet today. I'm sitting here with my new friend, Nejwa Zabian. Nejwa, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. Um, For women who haven't gotten to meet you yet, can you tell us who you are, what you do? And I'd love to know a fun fact about you. Oh, okay. So I'm Nejwa Zabian. I'm a writer. I started off writing poetry and prose, and um, that was in 2016. And so many people resonated with my work and asked me to write more about the topics I was writing about in poetry, which had to do with pain and loss and figuring out who you are and letting go of all the crazy making that people put you through. And so I started writing longer books. And I just recently came out with my second, I would say, longer book self of self-development called The Only Constant. So my whole vision in life is to help people feel like they have the ability to put words to what they're going through. Because I think there is a power to being able to translate your emotions and your thoughts and just your experience and your story into words that describe it vividly. So I I feel it helps people feel seen and heard in their experience. So yeah, that's who I am. I love that. Um, Tell us a fun fun fact. I know it's, (laughs) this is like the hardest question I ask. (laughs) It gets easier from here. I don't know. I I really don't know if it's a fun fact about me, but it's, uh, it's a fact, I guess. So I... I grew up in a way where I was extremely sheltered and most of my goals in life had to do with like big serious things like go as far as you can in school and be the best person you could possibly be like have the best virtues ever Um, which meant that I didn't really put much emphasis on having fun or on joy in my life and so I just, I'm 33 years old right now. I started learning how to dance two years ago. I love that. What kind of dance have you been doing? Literally any kind of dance, like just learning how to move my body to music without feeling ashamed. So a lot of the times my dance teacher will just put something on and just teach me a new, you know, choreography to it. And, or she'll say, what does your body want to do right now? So a big part of it has been to become comfortable shedding all the labels that I attached to a woman who dances or a woman who moves her body in certain ways, in certain settings, um, like to actually work through that with my body, not just sit and logically talk about it. It's been quite the experience. That is That is very cool. That is very, very cool. I really love that. Um, That's a very, that's a really good fun fact. Uh, (laughs) Just, just a gold star for you. Great fun fact. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so tell us about the book. Um, It came out in March. I love it. So it's called The Only Constant, A Guide to Embracing Change and Leading an Authentic Life. And I love the title, love the topic. Um, Tell us just a little bit more about it. Yeah, so the only constant came at a time in my life where I was going through really big changes, two main big ones. So I was coming to the end of my doctorate program, which to me symbolized the end of the race to being the best daughter I could be and being just the best version of what I thought a woman needed to be. Like, see, look at what I've done in my life. I'm a hard worker. I'm using my time wisely. So to me, it symbolized transitioning from constantly working toward goals that gave me external validation in some way, constantly trying to prove my worth in some way by achieving something or getting somewhere in life and getting to a point in my life where I just live. And that was so foreign to me because I operated on depleting myself. I operated on always finding the next thing I could do. And not only that, but completely excelling at it, just burning myself out to prove myself in that way. Like they'll tell you 
in the doctorate program, for example, you just need a 70 average. I was getting 90s and high 80s. And because to me, it was like, if I could do more, then I should do more. And if I don't, then that means that my priorities aren't straight. Like I was the hardest person on myself, but that didn't come from me. It came from my upbringing, my conditioning. So through a lot of the work that I've been doing with my writing, I realized on a logical level, hey, this is not the way life should be. Like life is to be lived, not just to be running a race that's never ending to prove your worth. So even though I I realized that on a logical level, I knew that this was the point in my life where I was actually going to go through it. And I knew that just like when you let go of any type of addiction, your body goes through withdrawals and you're sitting there agitated. Like I need to be doing something. I need to get that hit of I just achieved something. I just accomplished something. So I knew that massive change was coming after 32 years of just constant go, 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 go. And then around that same time, my grandma passed away. And that was a completely different life change that I went through that I never saw coming and never would have ever wanted to see coming. So here I was with this huge change that I chose for myself to no longer go further in school. Like I I just achieved the highest thing that you could, but I decided I wasn't going to continue to find something else where I would achieve something huge and a change that I didn't choose, which was the death of my grandma. And both of them brought different kinds of grief into my life. And both of them brought different kinds of realizations about what's important in life and how should life be lived. And especially especially with the death of my grandma, I was reflecting on what kind of a life I would in 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years When I would look back at my life, say, you know, I lived the best life that I could possibly live. And to me, that's the most authentic life that you could live. And so it put me in a place where I was having all these hard truths hit me about the changes I needed to make in my life in order to live a life that was authentic. So these three big themes emerged based on what I was going through. Changes we don't choose, changes we choose, and changes we need to make. And so to me... You know, it's very clear when you hear the only constant, the only constant in life is change. And so how do you deal with all these different types of change? And that's why I felt like the only constant needed to be written. I resonate so much with everything that you're saying. I It's funny because I'm the kind of person who, like I choose a lot of, I choose a lot of life changes and also a lot of life changes have chosen me. Like there've been a lot of things that exactly like I didn't see that coming. I didn't want that. But for a person who chooses as much change as I choose, I don't love change. Like there are so many moments in my life where I like letting go of things and transition and I cry my whole way through it. And I just like, I'm really sentimental. Um, and so I, I, I feel like I'm just this mashup of someone who loves and thrives on new things and then someone who totally doesn't. And it's there's a lot of like, there's just a lot of feelings happening in here. And so when I saw uh, that your book is about change, I'm like, man, it is <laughs> so... That's so full. There's so much there. You know, I'd love to hear a little bit more of your backstory. You know, you've mentioned mm. that you grew up really uh, sheltered, I believe was the word you used. And yes, um, you moved from Canada to Lebanon at 16, right? Like what, tell tell us just, tell us anything we need to know. Yeah, so I actually moved from Lebanon to Canada at 16. Okay, I I think that's what you meant, but yeah, you probably switched them. So my parents met and got married in Canada. They're both originally from Lebanon. They had five kids and then they decided they wanted to move back to Lebanon so that their kids could learn Arabic, which is our first language. And so I was born in Lebanon. So, and many years later, this is important to the story because from a very young age, I was surrounded by people who were much older than me. All of my siblings are much older than me. My parents are obviously much older than me, but I was constantly surrounded by adults. And so in a way, I was forced to think like an adult and feel like an adult. And so I 
matured very, very, very early in life and started thinking all these big philosophical things about life. And um, I also had a very heavy religious education while I was there. And so there was this like huge emphasis on having a moral compass and doing the right thing and following the rules and and just being the bigger person and and to to internalize that from a very young age I don't think is healthy because it gets you to invalidate very healthy emotions that might come up like anger like sadness like rage like disappointment or disgust in people like you think oh, it's a bad thing for me to feel that it's a bad thing for me to say that that's something inside of me so that's how my upbringing was and then my brothers and sisters started making their way back to Canada so at the age of 16 I was living with my one sister in Lebanon my parents were here all my other siblings were here and so I moved here at 16 and it felt like the struggle I had had before that, like up to that point, just when I thought it couldn't get worse because my biggest struggle was always feeling misunderstood and unseen and unheard. I was always like the really sensitive girl that everybody made fun of in school because, you know, they looked at me as, you know, you never make mistakes and you're just so perfect and all the teachers love you and whatever. I got bullied for that. And so I had a hard time feeling like I mattered as a person because I was always made to feel like who I am was either too much or too wrong or whatever. And so when I moved here for good, even though I'd visited Canada multiple times, I spoke English perfectly, I felt so much further away from that point that I was really hoping for where I would finally be seen and heard and loved for who I am. It just felt like now I'm in a, in a brand new country and I can't just speak Arabic whenever I want to. I have to speak English all the time and I look different and, and the rules are different. Like I, when I came here, I was so aware that things were completely different. The rules were different. My friends in school, which really weren't friends. They were more people that I had in my classes. I didn't socialize with them after school or anything, but I knew they socialized together. I knew they dated. I knew they did things like they went to the mall, they went to the movies, things I wasn't allowed to do. And the rules were very different for me than they were for them. Whereas when I was back home, the rules were the same for everyone. So now I was at a point where I felt further out of place and even though in Lebanon, I knew I wasn't feeling great. Now I was feeling much worse. And to be so aware of the way that I was feeling and know that at the age that I was at and with the dependence I had on my family, there was absolutely no way I could change that. So I started living my life in what I referred to as black and white. There really weren't these ups and downs and emotions, like really good moments and really bad ones. It was more like a flat line. I was very numb. And I just followed the rules of the people around me and was on autopilot, really. I was, in retrospect, I was living in survival mode, but I didn't have the terminology to use at the time. But I was on autopilot. So Fast forward to 2012, 2013, I started my first teaching assignment and a new group of students comes in who were refugees from Libya at the time. And the principal said to me, they're your responsibility for the rest of the year. You're going to teach them how to speak English. You're going to teach them everything about Canada. And so I remember looking at them and just resonating with the experience. Like I felt something in them that I knew I felt when I was 16 years old and I arrived here. So there was a part of me that woke up and said, do something differently for these kids. Like do for them what you wish someone did for you at 16. And so I started writing again, these short pieces to inspire them to see themselves differently and just see the world around them differently and that they do deserve a seat at the table. And yes, they might be different, but those differences make them even more unique. And um, 
that's the rest is history. That's what got me to start writing again. And that's why I try very hard to get people to see themselves for who they are and to find their voice. So beautiful. It's so beautiful. You know, you were living under so many rules. Like, and and I think that, you know, as I've been writing my book, one of the things that I've been doing a ton of research on is what are what are the rules, the spoken rules, the unspoken rules that we like, I don't know that they're uniquely American. Maybe some of them are, but um some of them mm. I think are, you know, are really uh universal. But what are some of these rules that are placed on women that we may see or, or not see that that we're fighting against when we make decisions about our lives. Um, you know, when we're trying to decide, you know, what am I going to do for work? Or do I want to get married? Or do I want to marry this person? Or, you know, do I want to have kids? Do I like, how do I want to raise my kids? You know, there's, it's like we're walking in the ocean and there's this unseen tide, like really pulling at us. Um, your tide yes. was more seen. Um, that I think, you know, mine was, how did you, like, was there ever a point that you stopped following the rules or that you started to like make rules for yourself? What did that, like, oh, what yeah. did that look like? <laughs> it was so tough. I talked about this quite a bit in The Only Constant. And I also talked about it in the book before that and Welcome Home. But Many people who are new listeners to me and who just discovered me probably won't know that I actually used to wear the hijab. I used to wear the traditional Muslim dress and um, or headdress, which meant that I covered my entire body and I only showed my hands and my face. And um, to stop wearing it, to make the decision to stop wearing it, felt like I was leaving a big major part of my identity behind and that I was going against what I thought would make me a good woman. So I had, in order for me to come to a point where I made that decision, I had to disintegrate something inside of me that attached my goodness as a woman to the way I dressed it was really, really hard to dissociate my definition of what it meant to be a good woman from the way I dressed. And it took me a long time to get to that point because every time I would imagine showing a little bit more of my body, even if it was just my neck or a little strand of hair, I would feel like I was the worst person on earth because I was inviting attention or and these messages didn't really come from me I was taught them my environment taught me them but you know there's that level of breaking out of a culture or breaking out of a religious community but that's not the worst thing there are things like speaking up if an injustice happens in your community which I also did and that also played a huge role in my evolution as a woman and in the changes that I made in my life. Because when I was hurt by someone in the community and I spoke up against him, I was the one at fault. Like I was the one who was treated like I made the mistake of speaking up and making the community look bad. And so that put me in a place where it just didn't make sense to me because I'm like, do I not belong to this community in the first place because they represent protection for me and they represent that they will stand up for me if something bad happens to me. And here I am after I spoke up, they are blaming me for speaking up and they're not looking at my pain. So that was another layer to it. And then I started discovering that it's not just my culture or the religious beliefs that most of them, I would say, that I was surrounded by weren't really, I wouldn't say God said, be this way. I think people said, God wants you to be this way. It was mostly that. It, it wasn't just those two specific things that I could say stand in the way of being a woman. I think women from different cultures, even if they don't have strong cultural and religious affiliations, 
are going through something like this where they feel like there is a certain definition of a woman or what it means to be feminine that they need to follow. And if they break out of that, then they're going to be somehow looked at as too much or they're a burden or they're too manly or they're, and you hear it, you hear it in the language where they say, oh, she wears the pants in the relationship or the guy is a simp for being respectful or you, there's so much language that's just specifically targeted at women. So I started seeing my struggle within a bubble like I was, I felt like I was stuck in this bubble of culture, religion, traditions, and all of that. I felt like this bubble was inside a much bigger bubble. So even if I break out of this one, there's still a much bigger bubble that literally every woman who is living right now is going through on some level. So it doesn't help to just because it, you can label something and see it so clearly, it doesn't mean that another woman's struggle that you can't label and see clearly also isn't a struggle. Do you know what I mean? So one of the stories I share in The Only Constant is one of a woman named Sonia Khan, who many people would have heard of if they watch these kinds of things on TikTok or on social media, but she that story went viral on TikTok a couple of years ago where uh, she decided that she wanted to get a divorce from her husband and she belonged to a very sheltered religious and cultural community. And so this man drove past state lines and killed her because he couldn't accept that she didn't want to be with him anymore and that she was sharing what happened between them. And she was shunned from her community because she wanted a divorce and because she started talking about what happened. So that's a story that you could see and you can very easily say, like, this happened because this cultural dynamic was underlying and it's very unfair and very unjust. You can label that. But you can also look at any woman on the street who's walking around feeling like she's not the perfect weight and that her body parts don't look a certain way and that her face doesn't look a certain way and that she doesn't deserve love or respect because she looks a certain way or she has a certain job or whatever. That's not something that you might be able to name and clearly see what's underlying there. But that also exists. So I think our attention when it comes to trying to inspire other women to be liberated and to free themselves from all of these rules that say, be this way, don't be this way, be just this much and not too, too, not, not too much more and not too much less. I think the way to do that is to stop bringing each other down and start listening to each other's stories instead of comparing our struggles and our suffering because we tend to do that like oh you that's you think that's hard okay well you, you should see what I went through or what another woman that I know went through and it's like we already feel so gaslighted out of our pain in general now we're we're adding a layer to that ourselves and we all know where that even stems from, where women are being pit against each other. That doesn't come from us. Like I I think of a collective form of gaslighting that we all go through is when people talk about um, the pain of having to go to a doctor and uh, put an IUD in. I don't know if you've like ever experienced that or if you've heard that. Oh, girl. Right? So like the number of people who are like, it's just a very simple procedure. It's And I read stories of women saying, I thought I was dying. Like I thought, it's like you go in and you leave and they expect you to be completely fine because it's such a normal procedure. I've seen so many women say, I couldn't even make it to my car. I sat in my car for a couple of hours before I could even drive home. And it's like, that's one, again, clear example that we are all aware of. But if you were to look at every struggle that we go through as women, 
and there's so many, like anyone who's listening right now, they're probably going through at least 10 that are specific to just being a woman. Like everybody can, can think of something. Sit with your people and listen to them and see their pain. That's what we need. We don't need judgment. We don't need, you know, I, I see this a lot on social media and it actually bothers me when I see like a woman post something where she's talking about her experience in a relationship or her experience at work or her experience at whatever. And everybody in the comment is like, well, you're so like beautiful. Like, whoa, woe is me. Like, really, you're just making a big deal out of nothing. Like, like you're, you're making a, and it's like you as somebody who's watching, if you think that just because a woman has a certain physical appearance, she's not allowed to struggle with other things. You're feeding that. You're feeding that narrative that says a woman should look a certain way and her life would be easier. So that kind of stuff really bothers me because we fail to sit with each other in our pain. And truly, to tie it back to the only constant and to making change in your life, it really... This message, I think, wakes you up to the fact that you need to have a certain level of compassion, not only for other people as they're going through something, but also for yourself. Because I guarantee you, every single person who's listening right now, anytime they go through a struggle of any sort, one of the first voices that comes to their mind is, well, something must be wrong with you to not be able to deal with this. Like, what's wrong with you? Why are you so dumb? Why are you so stupid, right? We hear, we hear those voices and, and many of us listen to those voices and say, well, you know what? I need to just toughen up and get up and do this and do that and show them that nobody can get to me, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no. What you really need to do is sit with yourself in that struggle and speak to yourself the same way that you would speak to someone that you really love. You are not choosing to be in pain. You are not choosing to struggle. You are not choosing to stay in a place where you know you shouldn't stay in. Your inability or perceived inability to change your life or change this one aspect of your life isn't out of laziness or weakness. It's because those are the limits of your survival mode that you think you can't survive. Those are the limits of that autopilot mode that I was talking about earlier, where you you literally think, I cannot live any other way. It's too dangerous for me to. So for me, a big theme in the only constant is that any change in your life, if it's led by shame, it has to be sustained by shame. And if it's led by self-compassion, it will be sustained by self-compassion. So when you talk about getting more fit or when you talk about leaving a job and getting into another one or when you talk about leaving a relationship or getting into another one or changing your relationship dynamic with your friends, with your family, with whatever. When you talk about making a certain change, if what pushes you to make that change is what the hell is wrong with you? Get up, do something, just do it scared, blah, blah, blah. That's what you're going to continue speaking to yourself with in order to keep that change going. And that that's why when we say to ourselves, oh, when I reach that weight or when I get that job or when I get into that relationship or whatever, I'm going to feel better. It's because that shame promises that if you just listen to me, something in your life is going to change. And it's like, that's why you get to that point and you're not happy because it's still shame that's driving the change. So anytime you feel yourself speaking to yourself that way or you hear yourself speaking to yourself that way, say, what's the most self-compassionate thing I could say to myself right now? I know this is really hard for you. I know that you're suffering. I know you're really struggling with... (sighs) how people are going to react to your change, the people who are going to walk out of your life, the people who are going to look at you and describe you with words like selfish and full of yourself. And 
you there's something wrong with you and whatever. I know how difficult that is. And I know you think you can't survive without those people. You think you can't survive without having that one thing in your life, whatever it is. At the same time, let's trust ourselves that even if we get to a point where we feel like it's dangerous, we've never experienced something like this before, we trust that we will be able to get through it. And the best way to do that is to look at past times in your life where you thought you really couldn't get through something and it was so awful and you did get through it because that's evidence. And it's making me emotional just thinking about this, but I remember having a therapy session where my therapist and I were talking about um, like self-trust and that message that we say to ourselves when we say, I should have known better. Or, or I knew better or I know better. You know, we say that all the time to ourselves in a way to judge ourselves for not doing things differently. So I was talking to her about that and I said, you know, I was very sheltered being brought up. So how was I supposed to know better when I didn't get to experience things that got me to know better? Like I was raised in a way where I had to be a good person. So I couldn't ever doubt people's intentions. I couldn't ever label people as bad. I I had to be the bigger person always. And then I said, so anytime I did something differently, like when I started dressing differently or when I spoke up or when I started living my life in a way that's more authentic to me, I would be looked at as like, you you should have known better. You And it was like this hypocritical thing where it's like, you didn't let me learn what to know better, but now you're judging me for not knowing better. And you're judging me for maybe being hurt by somebody when I didn't get the experience. And then I just sat there and I told my therapist, I'm like, you know what though? I did know better. And this is what it means to me. There were so many moments where something in my gut would say, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel right. Something is really off about this. But I allowed the value system that I was taught to override that gut feeling and and to say, well, I don't really have any evidence that this is not right. So I'm going to assume that this person has good intentions. They're not trying to hurt me, blah, blah, blah. But I said, I've always had that gut feeling that did know better. I just never gave it permission to lead. And as I said that to her, like I got goosebumps all over my body. I was like, I've, I've always known. And we, all, we always know. Every person who's listening right now, you have an inner wisdom inside of you that knows. Even if you've never experienced something like that before, there is an inner wisdom inside of you that is always going to tell you the truth about something. And once you allow yourself to listen to that voice and allow it to be in a position of leadership in your life, All the other systems that you were raised in, whether it's culture, religion, society, workplace, family dynamics, all these big systems, they become indicators for you of what places do I want to be in? What places do I belong in? And what places do I not belong in? As opposed to them being the, 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 the best way to describe it is You know, they're that committee, the decision-making committee that's sitting at the table that you become the person who's in charge and you just, you could hear what they have to say and you could tell one of them, you know what? I don't want you to be part of this discussion anymore. I don't value your opinion anymore. But I, I think one of the most important things that I want people to walk away with is... And that's, I think, the overall message of the only constant is, yes, the only constant in life is change. Life constantly changes. Everything is changing. Right now, as you are listening to this, even if you're not moving, everything around you and within you is changing on some level. 
But there's also one constant in your life that you have to honor, and that is you. You are the person who has been there with you since the moment you took your first breath on this earth. You are the one who's gone through all your pains. You are the one who knows exactly what you've been through. You are the one who knows the truth of what you've been through. So if there is one person who you need to trust in where to go next, it's you. And if there is one person who you need to allow to lead you somewhere in your life, it's you. And if there's one person that you need to say, you know what? Even though you might not lead me to the right place, I'm going to give you the grace that you tried and now we learned something new. If there's one person that you need to look at and say that to, it's yourself because you know what? You've done this with every single person in your life that you've loved and trusted. You have given them permission to lead you to certain places and when they led you astray, you didn't sit there and throw a tantrum and say, how could you? You said, you know what? It's okay. You're human. So why don't you say that to yourself, right? You're going to lead your life. You're not going to be perfect at it. You're scared to lead your life because of uncertainty, because you've never exercised the muscle of being the leader of your life. You've always waited for someone to lead you to a place that had a certain reward of either you feel like you're good enough, you feel like you're lovable, you feel like you deserve to be included, You've always followed those footsteps of others to get to that place. But now that you're the one leading yourself, what is the reward? It's not external, it's internal. So that's scary because we, when we're so trained to go for the external reward, when it doesn't exist, we feel lonely and isolated. And it's like, yes, and I talk a lot about this in The Only Constant, that isolation as painful as it is at the beginning, it's necessary for you to build that backbone for yourself of, I know who I am. I am the leader of my own life. And yes, I know that means that the opinion of those around me is going to change. I'm not going to be looked at as the good girl, as the people pleaser, as the one who never ever lets anybody down, as the one who never disappoints anybody, as the one who cares about everybody else's opinion. I know that that's going to happen, but I'm okay with that because I have so many, only so many years to live and I want to live those years as best as I possibly can. So when you build that backbone during that period of isolation, one of the most powerful lines, I think, in the only constant is it's something around those lines. It is not your job in life to find the places where you belong. It's your job to figure out who you are. And when you do, you will know exactly where you belong. So stop looking for the places where you belong. Start figuring out who you are internally. And then that backbone of knowing yourself and being in full radical acceptance of who you are will implore you to no longer be in places that don't fully and wholly and holistically welcome you as you are. And it will implore you to be gravitated to people who are emotionally safe for you and who are emotionally mature to welcome every part of you instead of being insecure about it, instead of being intimidated about it. I actually wrote something earlier this morning about this. And I said, it's sometimes you have to sit back and let people show you who they are. And sometimes you have to sit back and let life show you how it is and how it functions. Because a lot of the times what we try to do is as soon as we sense that someone is showing us a certain color of theirs, we're so in denial of that because we tie it to something about ourselves. Like, if they're showing me that, then that must mean that I, I'm i not worth the effort anymore. Or it must mean that I was blind to it before and they fooled me. And I don't want to feel that way. So let me cover that color with a different one. We immediately try to control. 
So sometimes sitting back and watching is the best thing that you can do for yourself because that's what radical acceptance about life is. And I talk a lot about radical acceptance in The Only Constant. And I say the the main ingredient for me about radical acceptance that I want people to understand is radically accepting something does not mean you are okay with it. Radically accepting something means that you see it for what it is. There's an element of, if I had a choice, I would not want it to be that way. But I see reality as it is. I'm no longer living in denial. Sorry, I talk a lot and I, you know, I don't stop. <laughs> I am I am loving this so much. There are so many things that you just said that I'm like, I just, I say this all the time on the show. I'm like, I need to lay down <laughs> and like, pr- like process. I just, you're speaking my language so clearly. You're speaking to my heart in so many different seasons of life. And um, I just, I'm so thankful for your words. It's like, just on the last thing that you said about radical acceptance, um, I had this really, the first time I, I, I've gone to therapy several times throughout my life. That's what happens when your parents are both psychologists. Yes. <laughs> it's like, it's just a really awesome tool that's always been at my disposal. But um, I had the first time I ever went like as an adult, I knew I had a handful of things to to work through. And it it wasn't like something crazy happened or um, you know, I had a big life change all at once. It was like, you know, this kind of bugs me. Or like I I never know quite what to do with this. And I sort of started making a list of like, these are things that I think I should probably talk to someone about at some point. And I remember in therapy talking about a relationship that's hard for me in my life. Um, and and I thought that what we were going to talk about was like, here's, here's how we change this person or here's how we like, let's really um, dissect who they are and why this is so hard for you. And, and um, that's what I pictured the conversation being like. And instead, my therapist walked me into radical acceptance and said like, one, this person is not in my chair right now. You are. And so we're not necessarily going to... It's not necessarily helpful to talk about all their issues. They're not here. And even if we did talk about all their issues, it's not necessarily going to change them. And what you can do is not change them, but what you can do is accept that they are who they are and grieve that they are who they are and grieve the the ways that they're not able to be who you want them to be. And you get to figure out how to move forward. And that was absolutely not what I was asking <laughs> for. <laughs> um, but it was so powerful. And I just, I think about that. I think about that all the time. I'm really curious. I have to ask. I, I'm, oh, I'm so grateful that, you know, you you had to rewrite some really physical, visible well documented rules for yourself um and i'm very i'm i'm just beyond grateful at your generosity with the rest of us who are doing similar work but i like i'm tempted to say well on a smaller scale or on a what but you're not saying that like you've so clearly said it's this isn't on a smaller scale it's it's different for all of us and and comparing is so not is so unhelpful. So thank you for that. Of course. Um, I'm really curious to hear like anything that you want to share about the process of actually can you pr- help me pronounce it? I would say hijab hijab. Is that yeah, how you pronounce so I, it? I wore the hijab. Yes. You wore yes. the hijab. Um, what did it like when did you decide to actually take it off and like when did you and and all the other things that that entails and what was the fallout of that so I was 27 when I started thinking about it and it was shortly after I had shared my story of what happened to me within my community with an older man and I felt like the world was falling on top of me. Everybody was accusing me of all these awful things that I never did and they were all saying you're making us look bad and It kind of, uh, you know how they say sometimes you're wearing rose-colored glasses? It felt like those glasses came off and I saw the brutal reality of what it is to be a woman in this world and in this community. And 
at that point I had started writing and I remember one of the biggest, you know, uh, things that people would say is, oh, you're making the community look good. Like you're covered and you're writing and you're helping so many people like, thank you. And I went through a moment where I was like, I'm going through all of this to represent us in such a good way. And when I needed protection and needed to be heard and seen, I was looked at as the villain and it shook my whole understanding of what it meant to be a good person of integrity and to have good values. And I knew deep down, I didn't think that covering up made me a better person. I knew that. I know some people believe that. I don't. I don't think that it stands on just the way you dress. So I started thinking more and more about you know, the kind of legacy I would like to leave in this world and how I would like to inspire more people, specifically young girls and women to share their stories. And, and I sat there one night, I had just moved out of my parents' home, which was also a big deal because in our culture, you move out when you get married. You don't move out just because you want to move out. And I didn't get married. I just, I wanted to move out so I could write in a peaceful space. So I'm sitting there and I'm imagining a hundred years from now that somebody wrote my biography. And so I see a picture, I see my name underneath, and then I see Najwa Zabin changed the world by. And then I immediately, immediately caught my attention that the picture didn't have me wearing the hijab. And I was like, oh, I don't see myself with it on. But that's how I've been projecting myself into the world. And so I felt out of alignment. I felt like I needed to align the way I saw myself with the way I projected myself into the world. So that's when this process of thinking about it started. And it was months and months before I finally moved forward with it. I remember talking to a bunch of friends before. You know, you test the waters to see how people are going to react. I remember talking to my family about it. And I actually shared a story about this in The Only Constant, which is a very emotional story. And I call it the airplane story. And it was with my dad, um, where when I first brought up the topic of taking the hijab off, he was resistant to it. And I later understood that it was because he thought I was going through like an identity crisis or something. It wasn't so much about wearing it or not because he knows so many people who don't and he's fine with it. It was more like, why now? Because you've been wearing it for years and years. Like, is something happening that we don't know about? So after months of having this resistance and whatever, my mom said, your dad wants to talk to you. I came over and we sat at like opposite ends of the couch and I remember being very nervous, like it's my dad, you know? And if there's one person in the world that I don't want to think that I'm a villain or I'm somebody who's seeking attention or I'm a rebel, it's him. So he started speaking very calmly. And my dad is a very stoic person. Like he is very black and white. Like logic is what leads him. So he goes to me, you know, when you first told us that you might take your hijab off, i I was worried about you. I thought maybe you're going through something. Um, And at the same time, I thought you're at the beginning of your writing career. People got to know you while you were covered. So they might think that you don't know who you are if you're going through this big change after you've made your name in the world. Like they might think you're shaky. Just like when an airplane is taking off, it's very important that it's steady as it's taking off and there's no weird movement. Like you're, you're going straight up. And then he's like, I thought about it. And I realized that you're not just taking off. You're already up there in the sky among the stars and all of that. And I just, I got really emotional. Like, oh my God, my dad just said this. Like, wow. And I would seek these moments of connection with him that I would get like once every few years. And every time I tell this story, the person I'm speaking to gets emotional, especially if they belong to a culture like mine where like, men don't really talk like that, you know, especially your dad. So right after that, this, because of where I was in my healing, a lot of resentment started bubbling up. And the resentment said, why do I have to work so hard 
to get a moment like this? Like, why did I have to be so lonely in this decision of mine for months at a time? And why did I have to go through feeling like I'm a bad person and I'm making this big mistake? And I charged through it alone and isolated and feeling like I'm excluded to get to a point where now I'm hearing those words. So that really woke me up to the built up resentments over the year that I over the years that I had to work through. And for people who are listening to this, who have this kind of dynamic with their family or with their partner or with their friends or whatever, I think it's very important to evaluate for yourself how important it is for you that they see your point of view because most times they won't, not because they can't, but because they value their value system a lot more than they value their connection with you. They think that you're choosing to be there for yourself is a choice to end the bond with them. But your choice for yourself is your choice for yourself. Their choice to end that bond with you or that relationship with you or to alter it in some way is their choice. So focus on the decision you're making for yourself and why you're making it. And don't be deterred by the consequences that you're going to get from others and the backlash that you're going to get from others. Because if they are committed to understanding you, then they will understand you. If, if they are committed to misunderstanding you, then they will misunderstand you. And newsflash, you actually can survive that. That's, uh, there are so many stories that I'm reliving as you're talking about this. And, and you know, I think that our, so much of our um, rule following in in every way is about us wanting to be connected, and that's biological. Like that's that's primal. That being connected, being part of a community, our desire to preserve that totally makes sense. But I can think of times in my life where I was bending over backwards, following all kinds of rules, abandoning myself over and over and over again to stay in a community where I wasn't safe where I wasn't actually accepted. Like I may have had a seat at the table, but it was up for grab. Like it, that was up for debate every mm-hmm. day. You know, I could I could sneeze and it could be given to someone else. I wasn't I wasn't safe, I wasn't accepted, and I can like multiple scenarios in my life. And you know, like if if I could go back and talk to myself at all these different ages and say, "Hey, like walk away. Stop following the rules of this like you may lose your spot here, but you're not safe here anyway. And and when you when you leave, when you uh, come home to yourself, when you start listening to your own voice, when you start trusting yourself, when you have that time of isolation where you are building that backbone, I love the way that you said that. You like you will find a place where you're actually mm-hmm. safe. Um, sacrificing yourself for a position in this community. Aww. Isn't actually worth yeah. it, mm-hmm. right? Um, I could talk to you for a thousand <laughs> years. I am so I am so grateful for your words. I feel like our books are sisters, um, which is so cool. I'm so I'm so glad that we've gotten to talk about this. It's so many of the things that you said. I'm like, I said that too. I said that, but I said it differently. And my story, the the way that like. I explained that was it's there like it's just it's very very cool um, our experiences and the things that we've learned and I'm just you've spoken to my heart so beautifully and I'm I'm just really Aww. grateful so um, we're gonna link to all of your everything in uh, the show notes and send everyone your way um, thank you thank you so much for being thank here thank you for having me this was a beautiful conversation. 